Dear Father, we're so thankful to be able to gather again and study your word. Father, I would ask that uh, the Holy Spirit takes the things that we examine and allows us to apply them to our lives as we go through our week. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So to start off with, we're going to go big question. So what's the purpose of the Christian life? Well, the purpose of the Christian life is to glorify God. Right. What, is, what does God want for us? Well, ultimately, God wills that, he, that each one of us fulfill the plan that he has laid out for us. And so when we fulfill the plan he has laid out for us, we'll rest in his promises. This will give us that inner happiness, inner strength, inner peace. Uh, Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So that means no matter what trials, tribulations, adversities you face in your life, that God has, has given us the tools necessary to deal with those situations so that we can have this inner peace and be free from worry, be free from anger, um, be free from stress, and to fulfill our purpose for him, which is to glorify him on this earth. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a look at a couple of Old Testament passages, the first Exodus generation and their, their failure in the desert, and then the second Exodus generation and their failure in the desert, and then we'll go to Hebrews and look at... Uh, how they look back at those Exodus generations, and then we'll do a little uh, resting in faith on God's promises. So, so we've got this big, long passage, which you just heard part of, but we're going to go Exodus 17. If you want to turn to Exodus 17, or, the, or you can follow along on the screen, that's fine too. Sometimes I get messed up. I don't turn it soon enough, but I'll give you a few seconds, and then we'll get ready. All right, Exodus 17. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to these people? A little more, and they were ready to stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And the people did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named that place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So we see this first Exodus generation. Um, we'll go through a brief history of it, but they're in a crisis situation. So the Israelites, right, we have the ten signs which God performed or miracles which liberated them from Egypt. God had delivered them from over 400 years of slavery against the greatest empire in the world at that time. Obviously, he had parted, parted the Red Sea for them so they could cross and then closed it back up, which swallowed the Egyptian army. He had provided two million uh, adults and their children he had met every need that they had in the desert, and he led them through the desert, right? So we see he led them, which is a tough place to be with no water, but he led them, right, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So for us, this brings out, or for them too, but it brings out a challenge for us. And that challenge is, is that we can see that the Israelites had been saved or delivered from Egypt and that was a much bigger challenge for God than providing water in the desert. So it brings up a question for ourselves. If I have trusted in God for the big things in life, can I trust him for all the little things? And if the big thing is salvation, then the little things are the problems or difficulties of life. And I don't want to sit here this morning and insinuate that all your problems are little, that are unimportant, they are. right? Especially with the, the last couple of weeks, we can see that the world can take us to our knees very quickly, can it? So, um, and it's going to be difficult for any believer. So you have to ask yourself in these situations, will he meet my daily needs or not? And again, it's easy to trust in him when the bills are paid and the retirement account's full and we're healthy and the lo our loved ones around us are healthy. But it becomes much more difficult to trust in him when adversity strikes and our whole life can be turned around in an instant. 
So, we're going to see how the Israelites did with this situation. So, in Exodus 1, we see that God was leading them to this place, right? So, he wanted the Israelites to be in this situation. Why? Because he wanted to test their faith. And sometimes we make the mistake as believers of thinking once we're saved, we're good, we're not going to face any more difficulties in life. And that's the furthest thing from the truth, right? We're going to get tested again and again and again because, you know, testing is, is how we grow. So what he will always do is he always gives us the means to deal with whatever um, tribulations that he gives us. So we can always have that inner peace and inner uh, tranquility of soul. Now, again, a no-water situation, right? This is a very real problem, obviously, out in the desert. And we may find ourselves in that situation, a place of darkness and despair. And in those situations, how do we react? What did the Israelites do? They quarreled with Moses. Hebrew word is to meribah, which means to complain or criticize. They griped, right? And as human beings, that's one of the first things we do, right? We love getting in a bad spot. We start griping. We start yelling. We get angry. And they also needed a scapegoat. So they beep, 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 beep. They found Moses, and he was their scapegoat. So they even got so silly as to ask Moses for water, right? They kind of become a rationalist, point like Moses has water, you know, in his pocket or something that he's going to pull out. Here's his magic canteen, right? He's got no water. So Moses does a great job, and he questions him, and he says, why do you test the Lord? Again, this is, um, we see that, was the Lord incapable of dealing with this situation? If he could handle the big need of freeing you from the Egyptians, could he handle this little need of water? And so oftentimes, we kind of reviewed this this morning in our morning class. In Scripture, God the Holy Spirit will use a question like this, and what it's designed to do is to stop you, right? Stop. Stop focusing on myself. Stop focusing on pity and focus on what's important. And that's either the problem at hand or the Lord and how you're going to deal with it. So, if we move on, we see that didn't really work with these guys. They kind of just went right through, right? They're still very thirsty. They continue to criticize Moses, right? And they say, did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock? And here we see the failure of the Israelites to trust in God and obey Him. And this is still true of us today when we start to, to complain or we turn to our coping mechanisms, right, in a time of difficult situation. What are coping mechanisms? It's a way, um, it can be different for every person, right? Some people it's being angry, some people it's being crabby, some people it's being sad, quiet, we get busy, we go to work, we turn to drugs or alcohol or anything, anything like that. And what these things do is they comfort us by distracting us or making us feel more in control. And every time we take this coping mechanism, Instead of taking God's word in, we demonstrate our unbelief in him and our lack of trust in him. Now, now we get to see God's grace. Verses 4 and 5, Moses went to the Lord in prayer, right? He demonstrates faithfulness in the Lord. And he says, what shall I do with these people, Lord? A little more and they're ready to stone me. And we see God's great response. God says, Moses, you know, take yourself and get a couple leaders and go out in front of these people. And so Moses did that, All right? And he went out at a time of great crisis. He still had faith in the Lord. And this reminds us of different times with Moses in Exodus 14 when they were crossing the Red Sea, right? Where he said, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Or David, when he said, for the battle is the Lord's, he will give you into our hands. So what was special about these men? Well, I would say that they were faithful men, right? They knew it wasn't about who and what they were but about who and what God was. You know, God uses simple, faithful people to showcase His power and His glory. And sometimes I think we can easily get confused. We talk a lot about learning doctrine, and it's essential, but we can get wrapped up in these great theological arguments, and it's almost like we're sitting there doing calculus, trying to figure out derivatives, when oftentimes all that's needed is addition and subtraction. That the essence of the Christian life is pretty straightforward and simple. And that is we study God's word, we place our faith in it, and we obey it. And we move on. 
So here we see the Lord, right? He told Moses what to do. He said, stand there, strike the rock, and water will come out. And Moses did just that. So we see the obedience of Moses. The water saved the Israelites. We see God's grace. So if we review this or take a synopsis of it, we see that this was the illustration of the failure of the first generation of Exodus. And now even after 40 years, right, they never uh, rested in faith on God's promises. And he told them to name that place, uh, God told them to name that place Meribah. And this is where they, the reason is because it was the re- way or where they tested the Lord by questioning his plan and purpose. And what happened to this first generation? They'd eventually all die off and never made it to the promised land. And it, we got to remember, though, this wasn't the incident that pushed them over the edge, right? They had numerous incidents and numerous times where God offered them opportunities and they failed. Again, they failed again and again and again and again. Final straw was when the spies went into the land, right? And 10 out of the 12 came back and said, we can't take the land. The people are too big, too strong. There's no way. So that was the final straw. So let's look at how their sons and daughters did. So if you roll over to Numbers 20, or like I said, follow along the screen, and it reads, There was no water for the congregation. They assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If we had only perished when our brothers perished before the Lord, why have you brought us into the, brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the Lord, the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to him, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and, we make, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded them. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation there be drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. All right, so here we go again, right? Similar situation. God brings the Israelites out in the desert with no water. Obviously, he had provided for them up until this point and met all their needs. So I would like you to kind of internalize this no water test for any problem that you face in your life right here this morning as we speak. And why does God allow us to go through these things? Well, God allows us to go through these things so we can learn to trust him. And so we can grow. Right? He's given us over 7,000 promises. And he wants us to take those and apply them to our life. Now maybe you say this morning, I'm good. I'm real good. Well, guess what? Prosperity is a test in itself. Because in prosperity, we learn to, to lean on uh, you know, ourselves or our wealth or our job or so, anything in this life, material possessions. And we don't lean on the Lord. Adversity and hardship are acquired so that our faith can be tested. You know, uh, I thought of Navy drills when, if you want to get good at a casualty, what do you have to do? You have to practice fighting it again and again and again and again, right? Dave's on the SWAT team, and, and, and Matt McChesney's also a police officer. And what do they have to do? One thing they have to do is go to the range and practice and practice and practice and practice, right? Because when that casualty situation hits, it's a lot different, you know, to aim your gun at someone and know that you're going to end their life than it is to shoot at a target. So this is just like the Christian life. God allows us, he tests us to continually practice us, and hopefully, you know, if we can handle the, the uh, charge of the mosquito, then we can handle the charge of the elephant. Now, verses 2 and 3, again, no water, and the people gathered against Moses, and hey, they, they complained him, to him again, right? Again, they go to these, this uh, rational claim saying, hey, we'd be better off dead, Moses, than we were here. And so we have to ask ourselves, does this ever happen to us? How do we react? Do we get upset? Do we get frustrated? Do we get irrational? And what does it accomplish? Nothing. Right? It just derails our Christian life and it gets us out of fellowship and we can't glorify God. 
So again, the, the four and five, the Israelites had the same reactions that their fathers did. And, you know, they panicked. And they said, we'd be better off going back to Egypt, Moses. Can you imagine wanting to go back to a place of oppression where they had suffered as slaves for 400 years? But that's typical of human viewpoint. In times of crisis, we like to go back to the situation we were in because we knew that situation. Right? Change is scary. Change is bad for us. We like to, even if it was a bad spot, we tend to forget all the misery of that previous situation. So, a principle emerges, and that is we cannot determine our happiness by external circumstances or geography. Because when we do that, we're always going to be searching for that next thing to make us happy or that next place to make us happy. God has designed us so that we'll be happy wherever we're at. And God also tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a difficult command, right? To wake up every morning and say, thank you, Lord, for that pain you gave me yesterday, or thank you for this test that you're putting me through today. So why does God do it? Again, it illustrates the grace of God that we're completely and totally dependent on Him and who and what He is, and not dependent on ourselves. It also helps to build, us, build humility, because you recognize that without him, we are nothing. So again, we got to orient and adjust our focus on God. Now we see here, verses 6 through 8, Moses and Aaron, they went to the tabernacle and fell on their face. Right? They did exactly what they should have done. They turned to their crisis. In their crisis, they sought the Lord. And <clears throat> right, God told them to take the rod and speak to the assembly and to bring water. And again, we're going to see God's grace here. So, Verses 9 through 11, we see the failure of Moses. I'm going to read this part again. And he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. So I think we, again, as a place where we can have a little compassion for Moses. Right, for how many, 40 years he's been listening to yip, 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 everybody in his ear, right, complaining every time something went wrong, you know, they were in his face, ready to kill him, ready to stone him. So it's obviously a very difficult place to be. Maybe I, I was hoping he didn't get enough sleep that night or something, you know, I'll have to talk to him in heaven about it, what was wrong, or what happened that morning. But we, we've all been there, I guess, is, is the, the point. But we see that God still provided the water, right? God still provided what they needed. But we see that Moses disobeyed. So how did he be disobey? Well, one, he judged them by referring to them as you rebels. Two, he was arrogant because he said, must we bring forth water for you out of this rock, right, when it was God? Three, he directly disobeyed God because God told him to speak to the rock and not tap it. And four, is he didn't glorify God, so he failed to give credit to the Lord. And so we see in our synopsis of this passage that there's a principle that emerges for mature believers. And that is, as you mature as a Christian, God will continue to test us. And the tests often become more difficult and more frequent. And all we have to look no further to 2 Corinthians 12.9 with Paul and his thorn in the flesh, right, where the, uh, God allowed the demon to give Paul a great physical ailment and he begged the Lord three times to you know, make it go away. God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, we also see some discipline for Moses. And we have to say here that when we fail, there are consequences to our actions. And Moses paid a good price, or a hefty price. He was not allowed to enter into the promised land. And I would say for us, um, I don't know this for a fact, I think one of the things that we see at that judgment seat of Christ, the Bemis judgment, is... We'll get to see this. We'll get to see where our failures in life, you know, changed our plan that God had for us and how we could have, you know, maybe had something different but didn't because we failed. And again, God re refers to this place as the waters of Meribah because it's where they question the Lord and his faithfulness, even though the Lord proved himself to be holy among them. All right, so now if we want to roll over to the New Testament, Hebrews 3, 7 through 15, and we'll do a few verses in chapter 4 as well. So 
So it says, verse 7 says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, well, what's his voice today? It's his word, right? It's 7,000 promises. And, you know, this is one of those places, I know we talked about it a lot, but we can't get away from, you got to memorize the promises of God. Or you got to have a quick way of, you know, it's got to be on your soul because you're going to need him all the time. So I listed a few of my favorites, 1 Peter 5, 7, Isaiah 41, 10, Psalm 55, 22. Right, but you should have, you should kind of be ever expanding and ever growing this list in your soul as you grow as a Christian. Verses 8 and 9 say, Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me in the day of the trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. So we see harden your hearts. What does that mean? That's repeated unbelief and lack of faith. And we know that God always has a rest for those who trust him. Right? That's his plan for our life is we rely on him, he'll provide. But what happens to our spiritual lives, when we continue to harden our hearts. Well, what will happen is, if we fail to trust in Him in every situation, you're always going to be reactionary. right? You're always going to go to whatever um, coping mechanism you like. Generally, that'll put you out of fellowship. Again, unable to deal with the situation effectively or place it in the Lord's hands, you'll try to deal with it yourself. So you wind up in this repeated spot where it's just a constant cycle of, you know, you go here, here, and you go to the same things, and you say, why do I do the same things over and over again? Well, part of that is because your brain, when you start doing something over and over again, the neurological pathways in the brain like to go the same way, just the way we work. But the soul, it's interesting in, the, in Scripture, this, the cardia, the, the, the heart, it seems to be when you harden your heart, that's why we get this picture of every time you reject, it seems like you also get a little scar tissue built up. And it gets a little harder to get through, for doctrine to get through. And so it can get repeated unbelief, repeated unbelief. It can get to the point where it so rejects doctrine, so calloused and so hard that it's called the blackout of the soul. And when you get to this point, it's generally the point that the Lord takes those believers out from the sin and the death. All right, verses 10 and 11, it says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As they swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So we see here that they failed to trust him, and they failed to even know his promises. Again, I got, you know, we have to know his promises in order to have any kind of successful Christian life. Because if they fail to know them, then how can you claim them? Hebrews 3.12 tells us, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So a pretty good, a shocking principle almost forms here. It is evil, or sinful, not to believe in the promises of God. Uh, verses 13 through 15, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our assurance from until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. So I encourage each other. Now we talked about this a few weeks ago in our discipleship and our sphere of influence, right? We have our three, our 12, our 70, our 500. So obviously those closest to you, you're going to have the most influence over. So that's, you know, what we encourage everybody. But how do we encourage those closest to you? I recommend in the morning... Get a clipboard or on your phone. Every time they wrong you or do something that bothers you, you write it down at night, then you read it back to them during the day. <laughs> Obviously, from Brad's lap, that's a joke, right? That's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But how do we encourage them? By being kind, gracious, forgiving. We're meant to be Christ-like. And one of those things I think we fail to do, or at least I do, is ask people enough about their spiritual life. You know, do you say, you ask them how their health is, but do you say, hey man, how's your spiritual life going? You know, or praying for other people's spiritual lives. If you look at Paul, every single epistle, he prays um, for the spiritual lives of those in that body. So we see that when we talk about faith, 1 Peter 5, 7, the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, 
even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ Jesus. So part of our reward system will be how faithful we were to God and to his word. Now, let's talk about faith a little bit. Um, so day-to-day, what do you have faith in? And we have faith in a ton of things. We don't th- I assume most of you got here with a car, right? When you started that car, you didn't check for a car bomb. Assumed that nobody was going to put a car bomb there, right? Or you just believed, you had complete trust in the brakes. You believed the sun was going to come up this morning. You believed the sun's going to set tonight. So as, as human beings, we have to have faith in a certain number of things, right? So we have to ask ourselves, why is it so easy sometimes to place our faith in things and people, but so difficult to place our faith in Christ? And I think uh, what happens is human viewpoint takes over. And so we think we can do it without him. We believe in our own abilities. And we always have that bad thing where we think we know what's best for us in all situations. So what is faith? Faith is assured confidence in God and his promises based on who and what he is. So it's a moment-by-moment Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? A rest. Moment-by-moment rest because of who and what he is and, and while we sit back and wait on God's timing and God's plan. Now, resting in faith, faith rest, this is based on... Uh, I learned it from R.B. Theme years and years ago, so it's partly based on that. We'll go to Hebrews 4.1, which reads, let us, Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. So of all the things we're not to fear in the Bible, what's one of the things we should fear? One of the promises of God being left unclaimed. So why did God give us our promises, because he knew in eternity past every single thing that you would face in your life, this week, last week, and in the future. And in his infinite grace, he provided a solution for us. And again, that's that inner peace or tranquility of soul once we trust in his promises and have faith in his word. Now some mechanics. So we'll go through Hebrews 2 and 3, 4, 2 and 3. It reads, For indeed, We have had the good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore on my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now the key key words in this is, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, whenever we get arrogant of why we're Christians or, you know, that we're Christians, we've got to remember what makes us Christians. It's that simple act of doing this, right? The good news was preached to us, and we responded with faith, right? We believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and that makes us Christians. But as we live the Christian life, God's word will not profit us if we don't unite it with faith, right? If we don't have faith, we're going to live just like all the other unbelievers, right? We're not smarter than them. We're not better than them. The only difference is that we study God's word, we believe what it tells us, and we live our lives according to that belief. Apart from God and his word, we're the same as everybody else. All right, so the actual uh, stage one, simple, claiming the promises of God. So we simply combine faith with a promise. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him, for he careth for you. So you have a problem come in, you, you claim that promise, you believe it, you have faith in it, and then you can be, you know, have the inner peace, free from worry, anger, jealousy. Again, it stops us, allows us to think rationally, allows us to have a little divine viewpoint. So first, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 talks about having being partakers of a divine nature, which means divine viewpoint. So once we're freed from human viewpoint, we can think how God wanted us to. Right? God designed us as spiritual beings to think from divine viewpoint, and that's how we're free from the corruption of this world. That's how we're new creatures in Christ, when we're thinking by his word and his thought process. So that's it. 
So the next part, stage two, is a doctrinal principle or doctrinal rationale. And this is as you study doctrine, you're going to grab certain things, bigger concepts, and hopefully you form these in your head, and you can form principles and rationales in your head. So one we've been learning a lot about in the, the morning class is the creator-creature principle. Right? So we learned that um, God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he was there in eternity past before the foundation of the world, and he and he alone created the universe. He had a plan and purpose when he did this, but after the fall, he had to orient that plan right, and change it. He could have swept it away, but through his marvelous grace, he said, no, we're still going to do this, so he had a different plan. So as the creator, God sets the laws and God creates the standards. God creates the plan for us. And he is sovereign, so he knows every single thing that has happened to you or will happen to you. So that's God as a creator. As creatures, right, we are to obey God's command and have faith in his word. Our object is obviously to glorify him. And we're always supposed to respond to God, responding to whatever adversity is striking us at the time or to the world. And the tough one, the hardest one, I think, is we don't always get to see why we face certain difficulties or adversities in life. And that's just us as, create, as creatures. God hasn't seen fit to, to always let us know that. So we just have to deal with that. Uh, another quick doctor of principle is logistical grace. God will supply all my needs. So this means um, for every physical need, God will provide food, shelter, and water, and he'll provide us every spiritual need. So... Provide a local church, he'll provide a word, a uh, pastor, teacher, and the Holy Spirit. Right? He provides all those things. So again, we see that as we learn doctrine, we get countless principles and you know that develop and promises, faith and promises, we claim promises, and that allows us to just the natural conclusion, we reach a doctrinal conclusion. And so our confidence in his word will allow us to face any adversity in life. A couple examples, right? Paul and Silas, right? they were beaten in prison, lying on the floor in their own filth, locked up in the stockade, and they had that inner peace or tranquility of soul. They were praying and singing hymns to God. Right? Obviously, they had faith in his promises and came to the conclusion that God was in control and God had them exactly where he wanted them to be at that moment in time, and they were okay with it. Same as David and Goliath. Right? David trusted in God's omnipotence, and he had faith in him. And so he wasn't fixed on Goliath and how big and strong he was. He knew it was the Lord who would be fighting that battle. So some concluding points. If we look at salvation, we recognize what was our relationship to God prior to salvation. We were his enemies. And we realized that it cost him infinitely more to send his son to the cross to be judged for our sins than anything else he can do for us. So Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And so God wants, we're his family, he wants to share his inheritance with us. That's part of his plan. He wants us to see all the spiritual blessings that we can. So we have to ask, now that we have done for the biggest thing for us, can we trust him for the little things? Can we trust him enough to hand our problems off to him and not try to deal with them all ourselves? How do we faith rest? Faith and a promise. And we, as we grow as Christians, we reach doctrinal principles and we come to doctrinal conclusions that help us to face anything that we have in life. The other thing is when we look back at the Israelites, we should see God's wonderful grace because God allowed them to fail time and time and time and time again. And he didn't, you know, that first generation obviously failed so much that God took them out. But that second generation, they made it. Right? They made it to the promised land. And what it reminds us of is what Christian growth is. You know, it's not a series that we don't necessarily success, success. No, it's, you know, success, failure, success, failure. That's how our spiritual lives work. Some application points. How was your week? And if it was a normal week, it was full of difficulties, problems, and trials. So was it a week where you relied on God and rested in his promises? Or was it a week where you tried to do things yourself? and rely on your own strength and your own power. Next, God's plan is perfect. 
Again, the beauty of this plan is it can be carried out by any person, rich, poor, slave, free, whatever color you are, all peoples, right, on the earth. It's not tied to a geographical location or government. It can operate in a free society or a dictatorship. There's nowhere in this life, in this world, where you cannot have tranquility of soul. Why do we Meribah against the Lord? Why do we go through so much self-inflicted pain when God is right there ready to help us out? Well, I think it's because we love to believe in the fallacy that if God were with us, then we wouldn't face hardships or difficulties or failures. And we tend to become self-absorbed, and we fail to understand that God allows us those difficulties for testing and for growth. Or we mistakenly believe that God is here to serve us and not the other way around. All right, so last point. If you're still alive, God still has a plan for your life. His grace is limitless. Our objective, right, walk by means of the Spirit, have faith in His Word, claim His promises, and sit back and watch the deliverance of the Lord. And that inner strength, inner happiness, inner peace come from knowing and relying on His promises and knowing that our mission on earth is for a short time, but we'll spend eternity with Him forever. All right, would you please bow your heads with me? Dear Father, we thank you for your grace over the past, for all time, Lord, but we thank you especially for the past several weeks. Um, Father, we thank you that we're again able to gather here and study your word. Father, help us to remember to go to you first, go to your word, go to your promises when we're confronted with our problems, our challenges this week. Um, Help us to memorize those promises, continue to memorize them. And we know that by placing our faith in you and your word, that we can have that inner peace which surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus. Praise things in Christ's name. Amen.